how do we know we made a right decision if nothing went wrong? 5.50 a.m. Pack all necessary gear. Transceiver. Probe. Shovel. Down jacket. First aid kit. Skins. I always want to know the product I'm using works 100% of the time. Because then I can rely on it for every day I spend in the backcountry. Being well trained in avalanche rescue and knowing that I use the best avalanche safety equipment on the market adds extra security to my day. I want to learn how to play safe and ski another day. Um, so we're going to transition to our last speaker this evening. Um, which who will be professional skier Cody Townsend. Cody is one of the most awarded skiers in free skiing history. He uh, evolved from a California beach kid obsessed with the mountains to standing atop the pinnacle of the sport. From a successful alpine ski racing career to stunt skiing for Hollywood blockbuster films or skiing the most insane line ever to ski mountaineering North America's 50 most classic ski descents, Cody has evolved a career spent in the mountains by skiing some of the most challenging lines uh, in the world with ease. His presentation tonight is titled The Normalization of Deviance, Decision-Making in the Mountains. And I'm sure like many of you tuning in this evening, um, I'm a big fan of the 50s project. Uh, one of the things I really enjoyed most about it is being privy, Cody, to you and your ski partners, trip planning and decision-making process. So I'm really looking forward to this talk. Well, thank you so much, Molly, and uh, thanks to everyone out there that is joining and listening in right now and supporting our avalanche centers because it's incredibly important, um, as, as everyone's kind of touched on, especially this year, as we're going to probably see an increase of traffic. So um, I'm going to pull up my screen right now. Hopefully that goes smoothly, and then we can get into this presentation. Um, there we go. Share. And um, play. All right. I think we are set. Um, I hope we are set. So this talk today, uh, the n normalization of deviance. Um, this was a presentation I gave at the California Avalanche Workshop a few years ago. Um, so if I'm a little rusty, forgive me, but otherwise uh, we're going to get into it right now. So what is the normalization of deviance? Um, First off, we start like any good PowerPoint presentation with a definition, and it's the gradual process through which unacceptable practice or standards becomes acceptable. As a deviant behavior is repeated without catastrophic results, becomes a social norm for the organization. So that's a very educated style of uh, quote there, and it comes from a very educated woman, uh, Dr. Diane Vaughn. She is a sociologist out of the University of Chicago, um, and she is kind of the She's the person that developed this theory called the normalization of deviance. Um, and we're gonna go into how she developed it um, and then how we can apply it to the mountains. So well, what Dr. Diane Vaughn did was she looked at the Challenger space shuttle disaster. Um, and there was of course uh, an, a governmental report and an assessment of what went wrong with the explosion and cost um, uh, many people their lives and just a, a tragedy on live TV. So the very first assessment that came out was all about production problems, like managerial mistakes, uh, and neglect of details and faulty technology, very typical and almost very tangible things they were trying to point as what created um, the, the fault that caused a rocket to explode. And Dr. Diane Van came in and did a multi-year kind of look back into uh, the decisions being made before then. And she was looking at some of the smartest people in the world being rocket scientists and seeing that like, wait, these managerial mistakes and faulty technology, neglect of details, I don't think that was the, the case for this. So people are incredibly smart. And what she looked at was she saw this over time, this increasing acceptance of risk. And as an example, and, and I'm not a rocket scientist, and so I don't know exact details of, of actually what went wrong, but the example of it would be as if, let's say there's an O-ring, a very critical O-ring to the entire rocket structure. And it is, the science says that the materials makeup of it can work between zero degrees Celsius and hundred degrees Celsius. Well, 
in the past, um, they might have launched a rocket and that O-ring was fired off at 103 degrees and they had positive success. So from them, they kind of, the next time this uh, same sort of thing popped up where it was 101 degrees, they're like, well, the science says that it uh, shouldn't work, but we got away with it that last time, so it'll work again. And over time, they started to essentially normalize this behavior of deviance, which meant that they were take, looking at their science that says this should not work, getting away with it, and then continuing on in their kind of in their path. And that created an absolute disaster. Um, the way she kind of interprets it in a different sort of way is evidence initially interpreted as a deviation from expected performance was reinterpreted as within the bounds of risk. So it, all of a sudden the science says that, hey, you can't fire the rocket off when it's over 100 degrees Celsius, but because of prior success, they deemed it to be acceptable risk. And obviously the, the science ended up catching up with, with them. Again, that is not the exact uh, uh, thing that went on. That is an example of, of kind of this normalizing of deviant behavior. So there's kind of the sociological theory and rocket science theory. And for us as skiers, we kind of want to know how do we apply that to the mountains? So um, we're going to get into it right now. So in order to kind of go through this, I'm going to start off with my typical day, and this is probably everyone here's typical day. Before you go out into the mountains, the night before, the day of, we're obviously reading the AVI report, um, referring to locals for beta, uh, your own beta from the past, and doing your own personal observations. Um, very standard stuff. When we go into the mountains, I like to use the five red flag system. And this uh, theory, the normalization of deviance, really applies to this five red flags. So if you're unfamiliar with it, the five red flags are things that typically cause avalanches as seen in the field the day of. So new snow, high winds, blow, blowing drifting snow, collapsing, cracking snowpacks, a whomping, uh, a rapid rise in temp all of a sudden gets super warm and signs of recent avalanche activity. So those are the, the most basic kind of red flags when you're in the field, you're making observations and those can say that there's a potential for avalanche today. Obviously you're basing a lot of that off of your prior day work and assessment. But again, this kind of uh, application works really well with the five red flags. The other thing I'm always thinking about is the heuristics. Um, if you are unfamiliar with uh, social heuristics, I suggest you just look it up. I'm not going to go into it right now. Um, it is very in-depth and it's very accurate. Um, Ian McCammon came up with this. There's a lot of uh, great media out there, but essentially when I'm in the field, I'm thinking a lot about these things. My familiarity, the acceptance of risk, the commitment, the um, expert halo, if I'm there with uh, you know, someone like Jimmy Chin, how is that affecting me? And uh, tracks scarcity and social proof. So I'm not gonna go too deep into it right now, but I suggest you look it up if you're not familiar with it. So, Normalization of deviance, how does that play into this? So it is pretty close to the heuristics that have already come up, but it adds definitely a new dimension to kind of your analysis and assessment in the field. Um, when I first started thinking about this was when I was on one of my first unguided, super deep backcountry ski mountaineering trips. We were getting almost a hundred miles away from our camp on snowmobiles and then climbing big mountains. Um, I was first introduced to this theory by a very smart venture capitalist. And I remember it was the summer before, and then I kind of started thinking about it in the mountains. And it wasn't until this day, this day on the Leduc wall that I really kind of, it came into form. Um, to set it up again, uh, we were really deep in the backcountry. We we're using snowmobiles to access our lines. And then from there, we were climbing up. I was out there with Chris Rubens and Dave Treadway that day. And so um, we were making our observations. And I'm going to show you a little video to kind of go through what happened that day.
Hey, Cody, do you mind turning up? Are you able to turn the sound on for the video? You, you may need to unshare and click the um, sound option in the lower left-hand corner. Hey, Cody, sorry, do you, um, the, the sound still isn't coming through on the video? Uh, well, it sounds like I was just getting notice that the, the sound wasn't coming through, which is really unfortunate. Um, I will try and wrap that back up real quick. Um, so essentially what we were doing through that day, we got to the base of this line. It was cold at the base of the line. You could see we were in kind of our warm outerwear. As we started climbing, we just started getting really, really warm temps and we, we turned around. And um, to, to actually go into it, I can kind of tell you a little bit through this uh, little graph that I kind of created called uh, circles of tolerance, let's say. Um, so if you guys are all here, we're all um, trying to be backcountry educated. Um, we are all probably consider ourselves pretty low risk people. Um, even what I'm doing seems very dangerous with the ski mountaineering project in the 50. I do consider myself a pretty low risk tolerance person. So as we were going into the base of that line, we consider ourselves uh, low risk. As we started to observe the thing, uh, the day, we started to get rapid warming. And that was one of those five red flags that all of a sudden spoke to the fact that like, hey, avalanche capability may come down. Um, as we started moving again, we realized we're under cornices and there has been fresh new snow. As mentioned in the video, we talk about there's been a lot of bad, bad weather. So there's two massive red flags right there. And we turned around. But had we not, and had we gotten away with it, had we successfully skied the Leduc wall, what would have happened was our risk tolerance would have stayed all the way up at this extreme level out in the red while we were considered could still consider ourselves low risk people that success would have made it easier for us to break the rules and i remember something chris rubin said to me that day and it was right in line with his theories like we have to turn around even though we think we're going to be okay just because of the fact that we have to practice turning around on the fact that we're seeing these red flags we the, the lot of other things were pointing to yes that day, but just to follow our rules, follow the things we set for ourselves and apply them to our mountain travel was incredibly important. And I think why the reason why we, you know, I'm still here to this day. Um, to give another example of this beyond what I just first kind of realized that this application to mountain travel is uh, something that can be applied to the decisions you make out there. Um, here's an actual scenario. Um, this scenario was up in Alaska and Hatcher's Pass. Um, to quickly go through it, there's two skiers. They were backcountry educated. They'd skied in this area for many years. There was no reports out there. They're in a remote range. As they were ski touring out, they felt whooping multiple times on the approach, but but both had skied in that area many times in the past. They also had felt whooping multiple times in the past. While they were out on that specific day, they came up uh, upon a natural class two with an icy bed service and rock protruding, so sign of natural avalanche. But they kept moving because they felt like they'd seen a lot of activity in those steep rocky gully walls in the past, and it was just something that was uh, akin to, to something smaller than the potential that it had. Um, ends up, there was an avalanche, a very large size avalanche, and one of the two men 
uh, was unfortunately killed in it. Um, as he quotes out, but we kind of convinced ourselves and this was a stake, the sound was down low and it was just snow settling in the bottom of the valley. So to kind of use this circle of tolerance to kind of talk through it, both of these people were educated, they had observed their risks. Um, they were obviously going out there making observations of what was going on out there. And they tried to make calculated decisions. They think they were, they thought they were being calculated. But as they go out, they felt one thing. So they conceded this as a minor factor. So the risk tolerance was going up without even them knowing it because they're they're marginalizing a, a warning sign. And as they see in, you know, on a class two natural avalanche they just marginalize it again by saying there's similar observations in previous outcome in previous times with positive outcome they didn't know it but their risk tolerance was growing massively while as they continued to push on and unfortunately the risk tolerance was so high that although they thought they were in that low level that they started with um, it resulted in a fatal incident um, and then so what we kind of look back with this uh, Dr. Diane Vaughn's assessment is they were increasingly accepting their risk. Um, they felt like they'd gotten away with before. And again, they were marginalizing those warning signs. Um, and not just to kind of point to one thing, I want to point and something so drastic as like a, a, a fatal a avalanche incident, I kind of want to point to some of the things I've learned in my own career and uh, time as a skier and really observe these little small little details that actually go a long way to creating this type of behavior. So when I was uh, about 19 and I was first getting into backcountry skiing, I remember uh, I live in Lake Tahoe and we generally have a very stable snowpack. And so, but I'm going out the backcountry and with my friends. So of course I brought a beacon because that's what you're supposed to do. But as I got out there, I realized I forgot it in the car. And I continued to go. Uh, that day was successful that I forgot it in the car and came back at the end of the day thinking I was the same person as I started the day, but in fact, I'd started to increase my risk tolerance. Uh, I remember it happened a second time and I said to myself, ah, it's okay, I've gotten away with it before. So again, I was increasing my risk tolerance with these very, very small, small breaking of rules through through pretty much ignorance. So I'd gotten away with it, my risk tolerance was up. And then at one point I reassessed myself, realizing as you're getting more educated that, oh, that was really stupid. Even if you thought it was an absolutely low avalanche day, you just bring that beacon, go back to, to not breaking your rules. Um, here's another uh, obs uh, example of it was uh, in 2010, I was up in Alaska. I've been spent a lot of time up there and I came into Alaska with the knowledge that Alaskan cornices are dangerous. That's something that we probably all know. They're huge and they can fall quite a lot. So you're taught, stay away from them. But over time, start to get comfortable with those cornices. Uh, this is about my fifth year up in Alaska in 2010. I spent time heli skiing, skiing big steep lines. So of course, you're gonna start to inch a little bit closer, start to test those limits. And then you're testing them a little bit too far. And this specifically was a friend and a partner who walked down the ridge line, went to go look over the edge of a cornice, started to step back and the whole thing went. So he ended up being able to self-arrest as a class three avalanche broke off, um, went down to the rock because of this cornice, cornice failure. And uh, ever since then, I'm an absolute sissy when it comes to cornices now. And um, you know that's what it kind of took is this reassessment and this close call and realizing it. And what I want to do with this bringing up of this topic is not have those close calls. I, I analyze these things before they happen know that you started with the rule that cornices are dangerous, so you should stay away from them. Um, and lastly, um, I'm gonna talk about kind of how we all can sort of move forward and apply this. Um, so for me, uh, as I've said before, you, you have to be very clear about your standards and your rules. So if 
you follow the five red flags or whatever basic systems you're using taught in avalanche courses or through experience, be very, very clear about them and be clear about them with your partners. Know those rules that are you're going to be a, a bye by with those people. Um, the second thing, I call this the ace of base rule. If you're familiar with the, uh, the 90s pop band from Sweden, they had a song called I Saw the Sign and it opened up my eyes. Uh, I think that's how the lyric went. But um, so essentially what it is, is look at those signs and actually take it in. Don't just see the signs and kind of keep moving on. Uh, let them open up your eyes, open up your mind to, hey, there's something else that might be going on here. This one red flag, this is something that we really have to take seriously um, because every time you go out there, it has to be take, taken seriously. Uh, third thing, be an example leader. Um, be the person that backs around, be the person that convinces people to turn around. I found it is a lot easier to continue than it is to turn around. You're left with more questions at the end of the day if you turn around than if you were to be successful. So if you see those red flags and you even feel like it's gonna be fine, set that standard and say, hey, there is some rapid warming going on. We need to turn this around. We need to turn around right now. Um, Another rule I call is the rope rule. So I don't know if people out here are climbers, we probably have quite a few. Um, the rope rule to me is that uh, in climbing, if you take a number of big falls on a rope, eventually you kind of mark that rope down to the point where you have to uh, retire that rope. And in a certain way, it's the same sort of thing is that if you have a way of thinking, if you've gotten away with it before, mark those, those falls to say down, and retire that rule, retire that rope, essentially retire that way of thinking. Um, look back at your, your own life and your own time, times you forgot your beacon. I got a little too close to the cornice and those times you really, really broke those rules and started to marginalize your own, your own decisions. Um, analyze those close calls. As everyone kind of talked about in uh, today, we've all had close calls. Um, it, well, pretty much anyone that spends enough time has had some sort of close call. And really take a look at it, not just from the like, oh, wow, we had an avalanche go off. That was that was a close one. Like really look, like what were the decisions that led to that point? Why, why did we get to that point of the day where that happened? Um, and then lastly, is just don't let me be, deviance become the norm. So Get your rules, stick to them, abide by them, don't break them because it'll change your pattern of thinking to essentially create more risk tolerance when you didn't mean it. And eventually that will catch up with you. So anyways, that's pretty much it. Um, actually went a little short, which is good. Uh, it usually was a longer conversation or presentation, but I just uh, shortened it up so we can kind of go into rules. I'm gonna stop, or into questions. I'll stop sharing and go from there. Awesome, thanks Cody. Um, yeah, we do have a couple of questions lined up. Um, Steve is wondering, the Challenger story is useful as it reveals the effect that upstream pressures, politics, money, competition with the USSR at the time had on the decision-making that led them to normalize deviance. What do you think the upstream pressures might be that lead backcountry users to feel pressure and normalize deviance? I think the, the number one thing is always the summit's the most important thing. Um, that is the kind of thing that I don't even think it's a social pressure. I think it's a it's a very individual pressure. I think it's something that we all kind of feel while going while going out there. You look to the top, you, you see the end of the mountain. You want to get to the end of the mountain. And it's uh, kind of that upward that pressure alone, I think, is such a driving force into your own decision making that day. Or even like uh, Sarah started earlier before, like you have plan A, that plan A can come the way you're going to think that whole day and your brain can get lazy. I really liked her presentation because it was so, uh, uh, it's kind of very pertinent to this sort of thing of how you can kind of create your own um, biases and your own lazy mind to like lead you to places you shouldn't be going. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And to touch back, back on another presentation, um, you say the normalization of deviance talks about how clearly unsafe practices 
come to be considered normal. And Eric just mentioned the wicked environment, um, which is an environment where feedback may be delayed. It may be infrequent, it may be non-existent, or perhaps partly accurate or inaccurate in many cases. How do you determine if your behaviors are unsafe in the backcountry where we often don't get good feedback? Um, and what's your typical deb debrief process like? So this is um, a really, really good question. And one, I actually should update this thing, uh, this uh, presentation with, so spot on, because I've come to realize that more. Um, when I started this presentation, I was not as uh, into kind of ski mountaineering as I am now. And now I've had more and more instances of turning around short of the summit and more instances of of questioning um, why we turned around and should we have had, or we, were, um, we could have been successful. And what I really, really focus on is that you saw rules that you could be broken by continuing on and that turning around because that you were going to break those rules is what you should reward yourself for. Um, I look back at some of our lines up in Alaska and they're there was times when these just red flags started popping up as we were climbing. We were 200 feet from the summit and we turned around um, and we were comfortable with turning around and because we really got down to the bottom and talked about how we, we didn't break our own rules. And if we had started to continue to break our rules, again, the next time it's gonna catch up with you. So I find comfort in, in that sort of feedback loop of like, here's your rules don't break them. Um, because as you mentioned, the, the questioner mentioned, it's pretty, I'd say almost never when you turn around from something, get to the bottom and watch the whole thing avalanche. And you're like, yeah, we made the right call. Um, you, you really don't get that positive feedback. So you have to create that positive feedback. And that positive feedback comes from uh, thinking like this, where you're not breaking those rules. Um, to piggyback kind of off of that, uh, Timothy has a question. Um, he says, I love ski movies, but often it seems it's easy to hide what goes on behind the scenes, which is one of the parts I love about the 50s project. You get exposure to the planning and decision making that goes into some of those big lines and shoots. Do you think large ski film production companies will ever get to the point where good avalanche practices are highlighted a lot more? Um, it's quite intoxicating to see people hucking huge steep lines in the backcountry. Yeah, so this is actually, it's not a question of like desire or want. Um, it's just a question of just straight up kind of logistics of it. Um, the fact is what's so great about this, this format of the 50 project is um, we're doing 20 minute mini films on one ski line. Um, what we see in ski movies is literally hundreds of ski lines. And what goes on behind the scenes for the 50 project in 20 minutes is what goes on behind every single line that you see skied in ski movies. So logistically, it's impossible to really talk about the decisions you've made to going into that. Occasionally, you'll see that one line in particular might have some discussion of, of the, the avalanche ratings that day, your decision making, things that are going on. But it's just, it's something really hard to, to do in the major ski movies. And I think what's great about media um, these days is it's created an avenues for myself to share the media I want to share. Um, the other thing is too, they have tried it in major ski movies and generally most people just want to walk away from a ski movie stoked and fired up for ski season, not thinking about how they might potentially die that winter. Um, so it's something that's like, it's there's just this sort of format of ski movies that doesn't allow for it quite as easily as something like the 50 Project. And it was kind of why I wanted to really talk about this and do the 50 Project and the way we're doing it, because I found it super fascinating. Every The things that go on behind the scenes on line evaluation is absolutely fascinating to me. Yeah. Um, Chris is wondering if you have any tips on good ways to address um, when you notice that your partner's risk tolerance is rising. Yes, um, this is a this is a hard one, and this can do some some strange things to your partners and your friendships. Um, I will say I've gone to the point where there are certain friends of mine that continue to be friends that I just don't go in the mountains with, um, especially on some sort of serious objective. And I've had to make that call and it's a really hard call to make um, because I just don't believe that myself partnering up with that person is gonna create the best results that day. So I think 
a lot of going into finding the right partners before you get to that point is incredibly important. Um, sharing risk tolerance, I think, is one of the biggest factors of a good ski partner. Um, knowing and I, I try to find that out before I go into the mountains. Um, I say if it's someone new, you really want to find it out. But I also try and find it out the day of if it's someone I'm with get a read on their 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 feeling their sensation they're going hey i want to get yeah i just want to go ski that line they're fired up they want to get up to the top of that thing note that because you know that the the decisions based upon that kind of desire might be uh, might be affected um when it comes to it also you just have to be kind of hard and it, it's the hard thing for us to do is to call your friend out and i've seen friendships dissolve because because of it but when we're talking about life and death uh, and we're talking about your uh, partner that's just not maybe you and your partner but a larger group just be bold and it's it again it's hard to do i've i've pissed off some friends and some other people by by sharing them by d uh, distaste for their decision makings but you know i i hope they would like learn from it and I hope I could learn from it. And I hope I would get called out by my friends if they did the same thing, because uh, sometimes we are our own worst analysts and it's good for other people to kind of, uh, to, to be there for you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And when it comes to um, like ski partners and your ski groups, Chelsea is wondering um, if fitness plays in to your decision-making process at all. And if that uh, plays a role in who you're going out with, uh, do you feel like there's a degra degradation in good decision making when fatigue sets in? Yeah, um, there is. I'm actually editing a movie right now where we talk about that. But I would say it's actually fitness doesn't come in too heavy unless it's the type of objective or the type of day that is dependent on time. So if you are looking at, let's say, um, the the skillet route on Mount Moran and the Tetons, it's east facing, it gets sun right up part of the, the first part of the day. And it has, um, it is known to slide uh, early in the morning after storms and succumb to warming pretty quickly. So if I were t talking with partners to go for that day, then yes, I want an equal level of fitness because you getting up there before it gets too warm is essential. But on every most backcountry ski days, no, not at all. I, I generally find if you're going out there with friends, you can slow down. Um, you, you, you're out there as a group and don't be egotistical and try and race people to the top. Um, I, and does it really affect your decision-making? I found it only at the kind of highest levels of fatigue. So you've been going for six days in a row, then yes, your fatigue may come into it. But for the most part, um, if I'm talking about fitness and backcountry partners, it's gotta be a vastly, vastly wide gap to consider not going out with somebody if their fitness is just that poor and mine's that strong or vice versa. Okay. Um, and I'll wrap it up with this last question from Andrew. Um, do you have any big objectives that you're excited about? Um, the 50s project is what's happening there with COVID or do you have anything further going on? Yeah, right no, just uh, getting ready to actually uh, release a movie um, from last season um, from the 50 project and then trying to plan for next year, um, trying to mitigate all the risks and hazards of a global pandemic, just like we do in the mountains. And uh, yeah, there's uh, there's 20 lines left. So I got 20 more objectives and uh, could take me, could get them done next year. Actually, it won't. Um, could take another 10 years. <laughs> so uh, that's kind of the, the plan just to keep going with that. And uh, yeah, it's a uh, uh, it's a big goal and there's a lot of big hard ones coming up. So I'm um, working my hardest to try and uh, stay in shape and get ready for it. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for joining us tonight.